Um, if you want to know the effects of a treatment on, um, on, the, on, the health, on health outcomes, ideally what you want to do is you want to get two groups of people who are otherwise the same, apart from the fact that one got the treatment and one didn't. Now, getting two groups of people who are otherwise the same is, n is not so straightforward. And the best way we've got of doing that is by randomly allocating people into, into the group that gets the treatment and the group that doesn't. And if chance and chance alone determines who goes into which group, then on average, those two groups will be the same on, um, will be the same apart from the treatment. And so randomization is really special because it gives you two groups of patients that are identical on average apart from the treatment. And so any differences in health outcomes can be attributed to the treatment. And if you could just explain the use of a placebo. Placebo helps to ensure validity in, ra in, in, uh, in, in evaluation by making sure those who um, by, by making sure that the two groups of patients are treated exactly the same way and outcome is measured in exactly the same way and it reduces bias and it helps you to get really reliable results. Now importantly, it doesn't mean to say that you're denying the group that get the placebo good quality care. So everybody can get the, all the treatments that we know are effective and on top of that, one group gets the treatment being tested and one group gets the, and the other group gets the placebo. So giving a placebo doesn't imply that you're not caring for patients. I think especially in the Ebola context, people have got confused about this and think it's unethical to give people placebo. Well, it's, it's not unethical to give placebo because you're not denying them anything effective. You're just denying them the treatment um, that you're uncertain about. And, there's n and there shouldn't be anything wrong with that. If we don't know if a treatment works, then um, you're not missing out on anything. So specifically for Ebola, mm -hmm. so why, why are these uh, randomized control trials needed? Because we, there are some things that we know are effective, and there, but there are lots of uncertainties. We haven't had a lot of experience in, in caring for patients with Ebola. And so the way we normally improve the quality of care for patients is by an iterative process of doing randomized control trials that say, right, this treatment works, now let's give that to everybody. This could improve the outcome further, well, let's random, do a randomized trial of that, and then you find out if that works or not. But many of the things that we do to patients uh, are not effective. Or they can, you know, they can be ineffective, and many treatments can be harmful. So randomized control trials are really essential for separating the good treatments from the useless or harmful treatments. Everybody should get known effective treatments, but if we're uncertain about the effectiveness of, of a treatment, then it's the right thing to do scientifically, it's the right thing to do ethically, it's the right thing to do all around. And in fact, you know, it's routine um, that patients are enrolled in randomized controlled trials in high-income high countries. You know, the way we improve healthcare in high-income countries is by doing ra randomized controlled trials. We really need to improve the care of Ebola patients, and so we need to do randomized controlled trials. You know, why should West Africans be denied the very important benefits of good quality clinical research? Why should they have to put up with poor quality research? The sorts of research designs that have been proposed, like before and after studies, which often get the answer wrong. And if you get the answer wrong, it's a catastrophe because it, you can treat lots of patients with, a, with treatments that do more harm than good. You can really damage people. You can cause a lot of suffering. It's not impossible to do randomized control trials in Ebola. If you can give, it, you know, if, if you can give them a treatment then you can give half of them the treatment. You know, if you can give them an untested treatment to all of them, you can give an untested treatment to half of them. And giving it to half of them enables you to find out whether it works or not. So I'm very skeptical about the arguments that people say that it's not practical. 
what about the issues of getting informed consent when you've got someone who's coming in who's very sick and there's no relatives with them? Okay, so patients who are really ill um, are the exception to the general rule of informed consent. So you don't always need to get informed consent to put patients in a randomized control trial. Now, a lot of people don't realize that, uh, but it's a principle that's been widely accepted all around the world. It's, it's acknowledged in the Declaration of Helsinki that if we want to find better treatments for patients who are critically ill in, in acute life-threatening situations, we have to allow entry into randomized controlled trials without informed consent. Now, we do that uh, in many of our trials because our patients, often they have se acute severe head injuries, so they're bleeding in into their brain. They can't give informed consent themselves because they're unconscious. It's not appropriate to wait for a relative to come in because all that time they're bleeding into their brain. So ethics committees look at the protocol and they consider that you know, the situation, and they accept that a waiver of informed consent in those situations is appropriate. Otherwise, we'll have no effective treatments for patients in that situation. If your daughter had Ebola, mm. would you be happy to enrol her in a randomised control trial? Wouldn't you want whatever experimental treatments were out there, whatever was looking the best at, at that time? Or would you accept a 50% chance that she might get a placebo? I would want her to get all of the treatments that have been shown to be effective. Now that's first and foremost what, what, what I would want. And the sad thing is in Ebola patients, they're not getting all of the things that we know are effective. So the reason that patients in high income countries have a low case fatality rate and people in, a, in low income countries, in West Africa have a high case fatality rate, is that they're, they're not getting the basic management of fluids and electrolytes that you would get in an intensive care unit um, or, or just in a hospital in, in the West. So they're not getting known effective treatment. So for my daughter, I would want her to get known effective treatment. And then would I allow her to be randomized to a treatment that we didn't know is effective or not? Well, absolutely yes. I mean, this idea of compassionate care, you know, that you throw untested drugs at vulnerable patients, and you can call that compassionate, it's really ridiculous. The standard way of assessing whether a new drug works is to do a randomized controlled trial, usually including a placebo in the arm that doesn't get the new drug. But are there situations in which randomized controlled trials don't work, or you can't do them, it's not appropriate? I think there are situations where they're probably not appropriate, they're rare. Um, if you've got a, a therapy that you've really got enormously strong prior evidence that this is going to be a, a medical therapy um, uh, from animal studies or other uh, preclinical studies, um, then you might want to try it in a few patients just to see if it does have that medical effect. And if it does have, uh, as it were, an all or nothing effect of patients who usually die, survive, then the evidence from um, that sort of study may be sufficient to get a, uh, a therapy into use. I mean, the classic example that's always given that nobody's ever done a randomized controlled trial of whether parachutes work. Most therapies are not like that. We're normally looking for uh, a smaller uh, increase in, in survival or the cure rate of particular diseases. And then randomized controlled trials are uh, uh, absolutely uh, relevant. Um, the problem comes, I think, and we've hit this with, in the Ebola epidemic, when you've got a disease which is, um, has a very high fatality rate, this is true for Ebola, it's true for some cancers, um, in sort of late stage cancers, uh, if you want to do a trial of a new therapy there, uh, is it going to be possible to go to patients and say, we'd like, we've got this experimental therapy, it may work, it may not work, and we'd like to do a trial, uh, but we're going to randomize you to receive a placebo or this experimental therapy, would you be prepared to enter that trial? And I think many patients, many of us, I think, if we had a disease which had a 70 or 80, 90 percent fatality rate, we'd probably want to take the chance with an experimental therapy rather than standing a, a 50 or 30 percent chance of receiving a placebo, which we can be fairly confident is going to have no effect. So I think it's perfectly 
ethical to do to try to do trials in those circumstances, but practically I think it may be very difficult uh, to actually persuade patients that the trial is the way forward. Now, the whole purpose of a placebo-controlled trial is that you have a, a very fair comparison. You know that the patients are the same apart from the drug or the placebo. If you're not using that design, how do you make the comparison? It becomes much more problematic and um, essentially it depends a bit on availability. Uh, if you, for some of the therapies that are being used for Ebola, they aren't in plentiful supply so not all patients can receive them and so uh, some patients will receive them, some won't and you can compare the survival of those two groups. Uh, however, with some of the other sort of antiviral treatments, they are in uh, fairly plentiful supply so everybody can be treated. Um, whether or not that does any good remains to be seen. But the comparison group then is more problematic and essentially what is being proposed is essentially a, a historical control where you take patients who were treated before this therapy became available and you compare their survival rate with patients who uh, receive the therapy. Uh, there are problems with interpreting those sort of data, but it may be all that can be done to actually evaluate these therapies. I mean, knowing what the case fatality rate is like without these new treatments is actually quite difficult. It's varied from place to place. There's problems to know who's included. Since the underlying case fatality rate might, without these new treatments might be anywhere between about 40% and 70%, how are we really going to know if a new treatment works unless it's wonderful? Well, in order to use a new treatment, you have to set up procedures in a, a treatment centre so that you can actually collect data in a, in a way in which you can get a, a good estimate of what the survival rate would be. And you'd want to do these trials in treatment centres where these procedures have really already been set up in terms of normal care. Uh, so you, you have got a good estimate of what the survival rate of patients going to a particular centre is. Of course it's always possible that at the same time that you put in a, an antiviral treatment, say, there will be other changes that are made with respect to treatment procedures that will make it very difficult to interpret uh, that difference. But it's, that's a, unfortunately a difficulty that I think we're going to have to cope with because I just don't think in many circumstances it's going to be practical uh, to do the classic randomised controlled trial which has an arm in it where patients don't receive the experimental therapy. If the effect of the antiviral is small, then it may be very difficult to distinguish that effect from, from bias. If the effect is large, then might, one might be more confident that this is a, a true effect of the, uh, of the intervention. You mentioned that for some new treatments there might be quite small quantities available. In that situation, doesn't it become more ethically possible to randomise because some people are not going to get them anyway? Absolutely. And I think if um, in the circumstances where you've got, as it were, two patients who are in other, otherwise similar, but you've only got therapy for one, uh, the most ethical way to actually allocate that therapy is to, as it were, toss a coin, to randomise. Um, whether that's going to be possible in the circumstances of the, the treatment centres, uh, where to some extent the staff working in the treatment centres are concer concerned primarily with giving the best possible care to their patients and imposing a research component on that care, uh, at least some view that as as potentially disruptive to with respect to normal care. And I think obviously if one sets up a research study, it is potentially uh, uh, disruptive with respect to normal care. So there have to be very careful uh, procedures put in place to ensure that there isn't that sort of disruption. So it may be possible to randomise in some circumstances. I think that it should certainly be tried. But if it's not possible, uh, it's still going to be necessary to find some way of evaluating these ex experimental therapies. And are there any sort of innovative designs that have come up to allow them to be evaluated without doing trials in the usual way? There are uh, uh, so, some, some so-called adaptive designs where essentially uh, all patients who come to a treatment centre will be 
treated. And as each patient either survives at, or, or dies by either 14 days or 21 days, um, then they will be plotted and looking at the survival rate continuously. And if the survival rate, and this can be sort of formally worked out statistically, uh, looks very poor, then treatments um, that are not doing well can be stopped very quickly. Um, if, on the other hand, patients survive very well, uh, then again, that can be accelerated and more patients can be put onto that therapy or in, in other centres. Or if it goes on uh, and it gets to a stage where uh, it's not very bad, but it's not very good, um, and you might get to a stage where you decide, well, we really don't know, and that might be the, the time that you could more strongly argue for a more conventional randomised controlled trial.